All right, so we will uh, we will get started. Um, okay, well, what? Um, oops, this is sorry, this is the wrong wrong window there. What is it? What's happening here? Oh dear. It's easy to get. I'm teaching two classes. It's easy to get things mixed up. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I made a mistake. I made a mistake in pulling up the uh, the wrong lecture file. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Stats 10. Welcome to Stats 10. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, it's, uh, it is, it's August, August 2020, which means we're more than halfway over this, uh, uh, this year of sorts. Um, so here we are, and uh, and welcome to uh, to Stats Ten. Um, I guess before uh, before we get started, uh, I do want to say I hope uh, I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, you know, just briefly before we started class, I just asked how are you guys doing, and and those of you who had your cameras turned on, you gave me thumbs up, which was uh, which was always a good sign, and uh, and and, uh, and I'm happy to see that. Um, you know, we are, you know, still, it seems like in the middle of a pandemic, um, um, I keep hoping things will get better, but it doesn't seem like it's going to happen very, very soon. So, um, I hope you guys, I hope you guys are doing okay. And, uh, you know, I just want to acknowledge that everyone might be in a little bit of a different place. Uh, some of you might be uh, struggling or you might know um, family members or know people who um, got sick or possibly even died um, and some of you might be in difficult financial places and you know um, and for for some of you uh, you know living at home is not a an ideal situation uh, for you and um, and so it's uh, it's tough and the idea of you know um, taking classes in the summer, something might be, might be a little hard. And I just want to say, um, you know, you're not alone. Um, we are kind of all struggling and um, grieving and uh, working through this together. And um, you know, it, it, if in the online format, it's it's hard to feel connected to your classmates or even your uh, teacher or uh, uh, others. Um, and so, you know, I want to encourage you to, um, um, you know, reach out to one another. Uh, I think having your cameras on is a way to kind of feel like uh, there's other people um, rather than just a kind of a list of names. Um, so that's, that's why I like to encourage you guys to have your cameras on, but of course I'm not going to demand it. Um, uh, so anyway, this is a, uh, just wanted to uh, start, start off. Uh, there. Um, I do also want to say that, you know, we will get through this and, and I don't know when it will all be over, but, uh, but we will, uh, we will get through at some point. Um, How do you know him? Do you, do you not know him? I'm so sorry. Yeah. Okay. I think somebody just accidentally unmuted themselves. That's all. Okay. Um, you know, um, the uh, researchers and scientists are are working towards treatments and vaccines, and um, uh, so you know we are all we're all hopeful, um, but uh, you know it's it, it's hard. But um, but yes, I uh, just wanted to uh, say that we will uh, get through this. Um, all right, let's um, let's talk a little bit about Zoom um, because this is how we're going to conduct all of our lectures. And I think, um, well, I'll I'll do a poll in a in a moment here. Um, well, not like a real poll, but um, um, okay. So anyway, on uh, Zoom, there is the ability to uh, to mute your microphone and stop your video. And I think those buttons are very uh, clear and apparent. So, um, so I don't think I need to uh, hit any of those, um, show you any of those. But also, um, if you're uh, watching, you can, um, there's, uh, 
next to kind of the mute and the stop video buttons, there's also going to be a button for participants and a button for the chat. Okay, so um, go ahead and click the participants button and that should pull up like a, bring up a little pop up or show a little window with uh, with everybody's names and inside the participants panel. There's going to be buttons for uh, yes and no, uh, go faster, go slower. Uh, there's also a raise hand button and things of that nature. Um, so if you see that, let me have all of you click the green yes button. The the yeah the check mark right there. Okay. So um, yeah, so it looks like uh, 60 of you or so, 58 of you have found that very quickly. Um, and I'm hoping to get uh, a little bit higher. So again, in the um, part, uh, in the window, there's a participants button, probably close to the um, mute and uh, stop video buttons. Uh, you'll click that, and then that'll pull up a window, and you can pull push the little green green yes button there. And occasionally, I'll ask um, I'll ask questions um, where I'll say like, you know. Uh, does this make sense? And if you give me a little green check, that always uh, feels good. I, you know, <laughs> we're not in a classroom, and so I can't really. Um, and when I share my screen, um, you know, I, I can only see um, just a couple faces at a time. So um, when you guys give me little green check marks for feedback, uh, it, it's helpful. Okay, or um, or if something doesn't make sense, you give me a, a red X. Um, and uh, or you can raise your hand, uh, gives me a thumbs up or thumbs down, any of these other reactions. Um, I appreciate those. All right, I'm going to go ahead and clear everybody's um, yes buttons there. So thank you for that. Um, also, go ahead and pull up the chat. And uh, let's all just uh, say um, hello in the chat. And um, all right, yeah. Let's just have a blitz of hellos and highs and uh, <laughs> yeah, this is exciting. All right, so this is, this is exciting. Hey. Um, <laughs> okay, and you can chat privately to me or to everyone and that's very nice. I hope everyone is doing well indeed. Um, so yeah, uh, you got questions, you got questions in the chat. Um, go ahead and, uh, and throw them in the chat and uh, I keep that open and so I try to pay attention to uh, to what people are saying. So if you have a question, um, throw it in there and uh, and I'll try to uh, try to answer that uh, as well. Okay. Um, okay, um, office hours will be held uh, kind of at the same um, same link and um, um, and with office hours, I am able to uh, put people in a waiting room in case uh, you have like a private thing that you want to talk about. In general, the default setting is people can just join you. They, they uh, click the link for office hours and, um, and they join. But uh, if you say, you know, I have a private question, I'll, I can kick everybody else out as, as well. Um, so that's... Um, so that's possible. Okay, and then you're always, uh, I believe, I believe uh, you have the ability, I think, I'm not sure, um, to set up your own meetings if you wanted to, um, to uh, schedule your own kind of like study groups or something, or uh, talk to a friend, whatever. Um, encourage you guys to do that. Okay, all right, well, great. Um, so that's our Zoom tutorial. Um, okay, so uh, let's just try out a, a quick informal poll. Uh, I'm just curious um, if you are, uh, I, I want to know what, what your people are in school. So if, um, if you are a, if you're going to be a freshman, um, go ahead and click uh, the green yes button. I guess, I guess if you're gonna be a, uh, a freshman, so if you're entering the fall and it's gonna be your first, um, first year at UCLA. Okay, we got one, one student, 
who's a who's a freshman go ahead and yeah click the uh green yes well welcome uh kyle is this your uh gonna be your first um class ever at ucla well i don't know okay well anyway if you're gonna be a freshman con uh welcome and uh congratulations welcome to ucla i know this is not ideal uh the situation of all of these things being online but um but I want to say welcome from the uh, UCLA community to you. All right, let's, um, I'm just curious. Okay, so who is going to be a second year, a sophomore? Oh, a lot of you, a lot of you are, wow, okay. That's like uh, over half of you are going to be second years and sophomores, okay. Well, great, um, even more, wow, that's a lot, that's like, almost everybody who responded to the original question of, <laughs> do you find the green button? Wow, 57, okay, that's a lot. Um, all right, well, great. Um, I, don't, I don't know if what, I, what I can say that's specifically for second years, but um, I'm glad you guys are here also. Okay, um, so I'm gonna um, go ahead and clear that out. Um, and so hopefully, well, at least those of you who are in your second year, at least um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that uh, we can all return to campus uh, at some point. And, uh, you know, unlike the, uh, the seniors of last year didn't have an online graduation. So, okay, um, third years, who's gonna become a third year in the fall? Okay. Some of you, some of you, all right, great. Um, okay, and then uh, let me clear that out. So we got uh, about 12, and then who's gonna be a fourth year or uh, a senior? Uh, we got a few of you also, great, okay. I imagine uh, the fourth years are just trying to wrap up their GE requirements, maybe, I don't know, this is, uh, this is what we got. Okay. All right. And so to the, uh, the fourth years, I just want to say hang in there. All right. This is it just the, the whole situation of distance learning and everything. It sucks. And I don't have any solutions, but, it, but you have my sympathies uh, at least. Um, Oh, anybody who's who's not a UCLA student, who's not traditionally a UCLA student, just curious. Okay. All right. Well, welcome, welcome to UCLA, and um, we're glad to. Uh, I'm glad you're here with us, and uh, and taking uh, classes in the summer. I hope I hope I do a good job representing. <laughs> our school, our institution here. I'm very proud of being at UCLA. And, um, and you know, I, I have nothing bad to say about any other universities, but I do have to say I'm, I'm very much biased towards UCLA. So, okay. All right. Um, let's talk a little bit about syllabus stuff and then, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into this. Okay. So, um, oh, I never introduced myself. Okay, well, my name is uh, is Miles Chen. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys have figured that out by now. Um, this is me. Uh, you can email me at this, all right? Now, I have to say, I get a lot of emails, and um, and I'm, uh, I'm, I sometimes can be slow to respond. Sometimes I can, if it's a quick question, I can respond, but if, then if it, requires that I have to take care of things. Um, it, it can take me a little bit while, uh, a little bit longer to respond. So for certain things, I'm going to definitely um, tell you, encourage you to contact your TAs um, about stuff. And I'll, and I'll talk about that. Um, so, you know, regrade requests and things like that. Um, I, I promise you it'll be handled much quicker if you email your TA rather, um, rather than me. Um, course website is this, and I think, um, um, I think you guys know about CCLE. Okay. Um, and I'll have office hours on Fridays. Okay. So our class meets Mondays and Wednesdays at 10. And then we'll, I'll have old office hours uh, on Fridays at 10. 
Uh, also, if that doesn't work, you can try to schedule an appointment with me. And then, uh, and if you do email me, um, or, uh, you know, if you had a question, you can uh, address me as Miles. It's okay. You can use my first name. I don't mind. Okay. Or you can call me Professor Chen or Dr. Chen, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. That's, that's fine. Okay. I do have a small pet peeve and, and I just recommend this in general in your, um, in your communications. Like when you get a job and you have to send messages to people, I recommend against just starting an email with hello comma or hi comma without using any kind of name or something. Um, those, um, so, so put in hello Miles, hi Miles, hi Dr. Chen, whatever you want to say. Um, but I don't know, I, I prefer <laughs> not uh, emails that just start with hello or hi. I know sometimes it's like you're not quite sure what to call the person, so the cop out is to not call them anything, but, uh, but it, it's kind of like when you meet somebody and you forget their name, and so you say, hey, you, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's uh, it's the written equivalent of that, and it always feels awkward to me. Okay, um, grading, uh, this is gonna be our grade breakdown and I'll talk about each of these components. Um, we're gonna have lecture viewing quizzes, some qu weekly quizzes on grade scope. Uh, there's gonna be lab assignments, uh, quote unquote homework, and then there's also a midterm and final, each worth uh, 25%. So let's, um, let's talk about these things, okay? Um, oh, and grades are assigned on a straight scale. Um, I don't curve grades. I, uh, I personally, I have personal views against curving. Okay. Um, cause curving to me has always meant that, uh, that your performance in the class depends on how other people, uh, perform. And, um, and if you just happen to be in a class of high performers, then your grade will be low. Or if you're, if you just happen to be in a class with lower performers, then your grade will be high or, you know, I don't, I don't know how, um, it just seems a little strange uh, to me. And I don't like the idea of pitting students against each other. So anyway, it's a, it's a straight scale. Uh, I see it as my responsibility to write fair exams. Um, and um, and, and you, are, you will be tested against the, uh, the content uh, of the exams here, okay? Uh, the only grade that uh, is, is based on kind of performance against compared to other students will be the A plus. That'll be the, uh, the top 5% of students. So in a, in a class this size, that's gonna be about six or seven students will get uh, an A plus. So, um, and, and that doesn't affect your GPA. I know it feels good to get the, uh, the A plus, but um, you know, there's a, so there's a possibility that you get like a 99% and, and you still end up getting an A because maybe there were seven students who scored higher than you. So. Um, but other than that, um, straight scale. Uh, we will have uh, two exams, a midterm and a final. And I'm scheduling them for uh, Friday. I know we don't normally meet on Friday. We don't meet Mondays and Wednesdays, but uh, for the exams, they will be scheduled on Friday. They will be scheduled on the Friday of third week and the Friday of sixth week, okay? Um, and the reason for uh, scheduling them on Friday rather than um, kind of during class time is that it allows me to spend uh, the Wednesday um, as kind of a review session. So um, when I've taught the summer class in the past, students often complained that the class felt very rushed and that they didn't have enough time to study for the exams because I would you know, cover material on Monday, and that material that I just covered on Monday would get covered on the exam on Wednesday. And, um, um, you know, as, as, you know, especially it was, it was kind of an issue for the final exam. And so um, this allows me to cover material on Monday, spend Wednesday to kind of do a review, and then you'll take the exam on Friday. And, um, and so that does mean that we will schedule you know, you have to kind of um, set these, designate these days in your calendar. Um, uh, but I think uh, um, overall, everybody's kind of grade 
seems seems to have gone better than, uh, um, and uh, and I think students preferred that. So uh, um, the way the exams will work is um, the exams will be scheduled. You can either take it at 10 a.m. or 8 p.m. Okay, and um, and that's just uh, the exams are two hours uh, each, and so. Um, so you'll log into Zoom at 10 a.m. and you'll uh, you'll take the exam at, for two hours, or you'll log in at 8 p.m. and you'll take it for two hours. And that just allows, um, and this is uh, California time, Pacific time, um, just so that if you are across on the other side of the world, um, and uh, you know if 10 a.m. is like, you know, one in the morning for you, then um, you know then 8 p.m. will be. Uh, <laughs> Uh, a more reasonable time will be like, uh, uh, you know, 11 and 11 in the morning or something, um, something a little bit more reasonable. So, um, so anyway, uh, we've got kind of two, two times for that. Uh, and you can take the exam and, uh, and we'll go over the details uh, for the exam as, uh, as the time approaches. Okay. Oh, all of my lectures are recorded. And so if you are on the other side of the world, um, you know, it's okay if you sleep during this time and uh, and you watch the uh, the lecture um, at a later uh, at a later time. Okay. Oh, all right. So uh, Zoom lectures. Uh, I like when you have your camera on, but I can't compel you to have your camera on. Um, and then, oh, I do request that uh, you don't use virtual backgrounds, just because some. Well, I don't know. There have been incidents with students using inappropriate virtual backgrounds, and uh, and it's something difficult to kind of police, and and it's I can't be fully paying attention to everything all the time, so um, um, that's you know the golden rule: try not to distract your other the other your classmates. Okay. Um, oh yes, that's a good question. Are your office hours going to be rescheduled for the weeks that we have exams? Um, yes. So for the uh, the midterm, I'll uh, I'll reschedule my office hours. So okay. Um, all right. So one component of the grade is the lecture viewing quizzes, um, and this uh, I've decided to do this, um, and. Uh, and and I got good feedback on it, so so we're going to keep keep them in. Okay. Oh, we got a question. Uh, are discussions going to be recorded? I've asked the TAs yes to record the discussions, so they should be recorded. Um, so uh, so again, if you, if you're unable to attend live, uh, you should be able to uh, to view the um, the discussions. Okay. I do encourage you to still attend, um, just because when you do attend, you are able to. Um, ask questions and, and make sure, um, you know, there's, there's interactivity. Okay, so the, um, the viewing quizzes, uh, when you um, go on to uh, CCLE, it'll, it'll say week one Monday lecture viewing quiz, okay? And then, um, and you can, uh, well, I don't know what it looks like for you, but you'll, you'll begin the attempt, okay? And it'll just be uh, three multiple choice questions, okay? Um, and the way these, uh, the questions work, it's just, it's going to be, there's no context to the questions. It's going to be just A, B, C, D, or E. And, uh, and so, uh, during the lecture, like right now, I'm going to give you the first, the answer to the first quiz. Okay. The answer to the first quiz, uh, which today for the first quiz answer is A, A as an apple, A as an apple. Um, is the first quiz answer. So if you have a piece of paper, write that down. Uh, you're going to write down three letters today. Okay, the first one is A as an apple. And then after lecture is over, you'll take the viewing quiz and then you'll just click the, the three answer, answers that I've, that I've provided. Okay, and the reason for that is that it will, um, it forces you to kind of at least watch the lecture or, uh, or attend the lecture, okay, and, and, and pay attention. Uh, a little bit, okay? And uh, and the reason why I've cho chosen to do this is that uh, I have taken online classes myself, and um, when there's, when it's an online class, for whatever reason, at least what I found, and, and in my 
talking to others anecdotally, this also seems to be the case is that um, it's easy to skip class. It feels easy, like there's not, there's, there feels less of an obligation to, uh, to come to class. And then, so when you skip class, you're like, oh, I gotta watch the lecture later. And it's also easy to not watch the lecture. And then um, weeks go by, a couple weeks go by, and then it's time for the midterm exam and you have like uh, six lectures to catch up on. And, um, and it's just misery, okay? Uh, trying to watch six statistics lectures in a row is, uh, is, is not fun, okay? Um, so, so anyway, I put these uh, lecture viewing quizzes and the viewing quizzes are open only for a small window. So today, the viewing quiz that corresponds to today's lecture is open today and tomorrow only. So, um, so you have to kind of watch the lecture and respond to the quiz during that window, okay? And then Wednesdays, um, the viewing quiz for Wednesday's lecture will be open Wednesday through Friday. So you have to watch the lecture and respond to the quiz uh, in that window. And it just, uh, it just puts a little bit of pressure on you guys to, uh, to make sure you watch the quiz and or watch the lecture and respond to the quiz. Uh, and it kind of forces you to kind of keep up with the lecture so, so nobody falls behind. Um, and that's gonna be worth 18% of your grade. So it's worth quite a bit. Um, there, if you just watch the lectures and keep up, they should be uh, very, very, very easy points to, uh, to earn, okay? Um, I do drop one, so there's gonna be a total of 10 of these quizzes and I will drop uh, one of them, okay? So, um, so that should be, um, so, uh, so if you do miss one, um, you'll, you'll miss one and, and that's fine. But if, um, you know, please, you know, it, don't forget, okay? That, that's my, uh, uh, the most important encouragement is don't forget to do the viewing quizzes, okay? Um, if you forget and you email me and say, I forgot, I'm gonna say, you know, everybody gets one drop and, um, and please don't forget more than once, okay? So, uh, so everybody de uh, does get one dropped quiz, but, uh, but other than that, please make sure you remember to take your viewing quizzes. Okay, we've got a question. Are we able to attend a different discussion section than we are enrolled in? All right, oh, okay, so let me talk about discussion sections. The, uh, the TAs, I told the TAs to go ahead and just combine um, discussion sections. So generally, when there was a discussion section, it was, it was limited by classroom size. Um, so uh, the, I believe the TAs have sent emails, but, uh, but basically, um, uh, sections A and B will be combined into one session that will be recorded and then section C and D will be uh, um, combined into one section uh, that will be recorded. Um, now, if you're asking to kind of switch over into the other TA's section, um, I will leave that up to the TA's disc disc discretion. You can, uh, you can contact them and ask if, if they're okay uh, with that. Um, but what they'll be doing is they will be covering um, the uh, the lab, um, uh, which uh, um, you know in the beginning the lab can feel uh, overwhelming, especially if if you've never used the uh, the program before. Um, so, but uh, but you've got some uh, really great TAs uh, that that know what they're doing and uh, and uh, enjoy uh, teaching and whatnot. And so um, so I encourage you guys to attend. Uh, section. Uh, it will be recorded uh, for your reference in case you need to uh, to view things again. So, uh, so anyway, that's that. Okay. Are there any questions on the the viewing quiz? All right. So again, for uh, week one Monday's lecture viewing quiz, the uh, the first quiz answer is A. I've already given this. Um, as as we go on, I'll. Uh, I'll give you the other two, two answers, but the first one is A as an apple. Uh, and so you wanna make sure you have that written down so you can respond to the quiz um, after lecture is over. Okay, um, each week uh, there will be a quiz on grade scope, okay? Uh, I should say there's, so every week there's not an exam. So you'll have um, 
for, for these uh, grade scope quizzes. And the, um, the way the quizzes work is uh, you get uh, each quiz lasts uh, one hour and they're going to show up in this quizzes and exams section. Okay, so you're gonna click quizzes and exams and then you'll click the, uh, the link for, uh, for quiz one and um, and, you, and you'll take the quiz, okay? Now, um, don't, uh, quiz one's not available right now. It's not gonna be available until after Wednesday's lecture because it covers uh, material up through Wednesday's lecture, but well, what's gonna happen is um, when you click it, it'll take you to the GradeScope website, and then uh, at, at the GradeScope website, you will um, download the quiz file and, uh, and fill out your answers for the, uh, the quiz file and then you'll scan your answers and, uh, and upload it. Well, you have a few options, okay? Um, one is uh, if you have a, a tablet or something where you can write directly on PDF documents, that's one option. You can download the quiz, write your answers directly on the PDF document, save it and upload it back to, um, to Gradescope. The other option is you can uh, download it, print it out, write your answers on the printed piece of paper and then, um, and then scan it. Um, I'm assuming you guys all have some kind of phone with a camera and, um, and you can download a, a scanner app or most phones have some, some kind of built-in thing where you can take pictures and turn it into a PDF and you'll do that and, and upload it. And if you don't have a printer, you can just take a blank piece of paper. You can write out your answers on a blank piece of paper, scan, um, take pictures or scan that and, uh, and upload it, okay? And, uh, and we're gonna have weekly uh, quizzes on, uh, on Gradescope in that form. Um, the quizzes are worth 3% each, okay? So they are uh, intended to be very low stakes uh, quizzes. And so if you mess up on the quiz, like you get 50% on a quiz or something, something, something goes wrong and you don't do well on the quiz, it's not the end of the world, okay? Um, you lose half the points on the quiz, uh, it's gonna be worth one and a half percentage points of your total grade. Um, the, uh, you know, messing up the midterm or the final is a little bit more serious, um, but the quizzes are intended to be low stakes, okay? Uh, the quiz window is timed in uh, that when you go to grade scope and you download the quiz, it automatically starts a, a timer, okay? And I think I've given everybody 65 minutes for the, the timer and you have to keep track of your own time, okay? And so um, the 65 minutes was come up with, I came up with that because um, the quizzes are intended to be finished in 50 minutes, okay? That's how much a uh, regular discussion section is, uh, how much time you have in discussion section, you have about 50 minutes. And then I gave you an extra 15 minutes to handle um, kind of scanning and uploading the quiz, okay? Um, and you have to get it in that 65 minutes. If, uh, if you take too long, like if you wait until 64 minutes to start scanning and, or uploading um, and something goes wrong on the internet and it, uh, it doesn't accept it, then, then Gradescope's not gonna accept your quiz, okay? So please, please, please make sure you give yourself enough time to scan your quiz and upload it um, within that 65 minute window, all right? Uh, how many questions will be on a quiz? Uh, most of my quizzes are one sheet of paper front and back, okay? Um, and so depending on the nature of the questions, there, you know, uh, several questions will fit in there or not. Um, so they're, they're not intended to be um, uh, crazy, um, crazy hard, okay? Uh, and they're low stakes, and if you mess it up, it's not that big of a deal. Um, they're intended to be kind of learning opportunities. Um, did anyone else get an email to download our studio? Uh, yes, the TAs, I asked the TAs to send out emails about um, installing R and R Studio onto your computer. And um, that is going to be the software that we'll use for the lab. So, um, so today in your discussion section, they'll, they'll lead you through uh, the uh, lab one, which will at least get you familiar with R and R Studio, and um, um, you know, I didn't want the entire time to be taken up by 
like how do you install the program? So, um, so they might show you uh, just, so hopefully the, uh, the email um, is, uh, was helpful at least providing the links on uh, downloading the, uh, the program um, and installing it on your computer. Yeah, it's not a scam. It's not like trying to get you to install a virus or something. Okay, well questions, I'm assuming will questions on the quiz be similar to the homework problems? Um, I, I think that's my intention. My intention is that the quiz and exam questions are very doable if you've done your homework. Um, the, uh, it's, it's not my intention to be writing tricky, tricky questions that are unfair or something. So that's, that's my intention, of course. Um, won't be exactly the same. So. All right. Um, you know, the, so the TAs will handle um, everything, everything uh, for the lab. Okay. So they will, um, uh, they will cover how to do the lab and, uh, you know, what they're expecting. Um, the labs, uh, the due dates for the labs are Tuesdays at 6 p.m. So if you, um, um, this is, you get the syllabus, you know, I definitely recommend paying attention to the, uh, the course calendar and this is how uh, when things will be due, okay? So, um, so today is uh, week one Monday and then um, Tuesday the viewing quiz is due and then on Wednesday we'll have the lecture and then on Friday the viewing quiz is due. Um, lab one is due next Tuesday, okay? And the due dates for the labs are generally 6 p.m. California time so if you live in another time zone, uh, you know, you got to figure out everything um, according to your time zone, okay? And um, uh, anyway, this is, uh, this is the late policy regarding uh, lab assignments here, okay? Um, and it, anything, um, contact your TAs. So if you, if you feel like something went wrong in terms of grading your quiz or grading your lab, uh, contact the TA. Um, and, um, and they, they have the authority to, uh, to make corrections. Um, just, uh, I just know that if you contact me, it'll take, <laughs> it'll take me a long, a longer time to, uh, to get back to you. I, I just have, I'm like swamped. I get so many emails every day. So the TAs, um, you'll, you'll get a faster response from them. Okay, we've got, let me see these questions. Okay, will we have an opportunity to review the questions we get incorrect on the quiz so that we can improve for the exam? Okay, so um, the quizzes are examined by, or, or quizzes are uh, graded by um, uh, graduate students uh, who are also students. And so um, I do ask that they try to get their, uh, the quizzes graded um, in, a, in a timely uh, manner so that you can uh, review them. Um, Sometimes it doesn't happen as quickly as students want. So, um, um, so I will say we will try, uh, but I don't want to make any promises that I can't, uh, that I can't keep. Okay. Um, that said, uh, you know, for the midterm and final exams, I do hold review sessions uh, the Wednesday before the exam that, um, that hopefully will be uh, an opportunity for you to, uh, ask questions and make sure you have a, a understanding. Okay, and another question says, what if we can't make either of the combined discussion section times due to a class conflict? Um, if, uh, that's interesting. Okay, so it, if that's the case, then it, I guess uh, it's possible that you will not be able to attend live at all. So, um, so the discussion, the combined times will be um, I believe the kind of the first, so um, it'll be either from 12 to 12.50 or from 2 to 2.50, uh, I think will be the uh, kind of the discussion sections, okay? And so in that case, uh, you know, uh, my, my sincere apologies, and, uh, and I hope that you are able to attend um, one of those sessions live, but, um, but if that's not the case, then and it might not be possible. And, uh, you know, um, all of the discussion sections will be recorded. So that, that would be my consolation. And I'm, and I'm sorry for the um, kind of the inconvenience of 
recombining the um, discussion sections there. Um, all right, does anyone know if any printers on campus are going to be open during C session? Okay, ooh. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if uh, any printers on campus are open. Um, my understanding is that most of the buildings are not generally open. Um, you might be able to swipe in, but uh, but a lot of places are are closed. So um, you can get through the entire class without a printer. Okay, um, you you don't need a printer. It's it's just an option. Uh, for the quiz, you can download and print it out and write it on, write your answers directly on the quiz. But if you don't have a printer, you can answer your quiz answers on a blank sheet of paper uh, and scan it and, and, and upload. So you don't need a printer to, uh, to get through the class. Okay, the Excel files we are supposed to download offer four different Excel type of file to save as. Which one should we save them as? Hmm? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so if we go to lab one, uh, births.csv. So uh, if you download this, save it as a .csv. And if you download this, save it as a .txt. I don't, I think, I think that's, I think that's what we wanna do. Um, but, uh, but I would say all of your questions related to the lab uh, direct towards your TAs. They're, they're gonna be the ones that, um, that finish, okay. If 4A and 4B are meeting at the same time, which time is that? Because CCLE shows different times for each of those discussions. Uh, I believe the TAs would have emailed out when uh, the section is meeting. They, they, they should have uh, emailed that out. But I believe, um, I believe they're meeting at the, the first, okay? So 4A, 4B will meet during the 4A time, which is 12 to 12.50. I believe that's the... Uh, I believe that's the plan, okay? And then uh, 4C and 4D will meet from 2 to 2.50. All right, are there any other uh, questions here? Four A four B is 1 to 2 p.m. based on the email? Okay, all right, thank you for, uh, for letting, letting us know. Okay, so 4A to 4B is 1 to 2 p.m. based on the email, okay. Um, that should give everybody a, uh, uh, a window for uh, grabbing a bite to eat for lunch then. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for uh, that clarification there. All right, um, homework. Okay, so I assign homework from the, uh, the textbook and um, the, uh, I believe I sent out information regarding the, uh, the textbook that we have. So this is uh, the Essential Statistics second edition uh, textbook. This is um, one of the textbooks available. There's another one that's uh, Introductory Statistics third edition, um, and I assign homework problems from the uh, the textbook. Okay. Now uh, I am not going to bother collecting um, the homework, so I'm not going to ask you guys to scan your homeworks and upload them or anything like that. Uh, this is going to be kind of just on the honor system. I assign the homework. I expect you to do the homework. And at the end of the quarter, um, I'm going to give everybody 100% for their, uh, their homework grade, okay? Um, which, you know, that said, it, it's possible that you don't do any of your homework um, and you'll still get 100% for your homework grade, okay? But really, you're, you're just kind of hurting yourself in that... Um, the homework is intended to be a learning opportunity for you so that you'll get some practice before the, uh, the exams and for the quizzes. And, uh, and so I strongly encourage you guys to do the homework. Um, uh, that's, that's why I assigned the homework. It's not, it's not because I want you guys, it's because I, it's not because I actually want to collect homework or anything like that. It's, it's, for you to, um, to learn. So, so please do your homework, um, but whether you do it or not, um, everybody will get 100% for their, uh, for their homework grade, okay? And, uh, and that's worth, uh, I think, 10%. So that's, I think that's fairly generous uh, regarding um, homework. So, um, so you have that, okay? Uh, so please do your homework, uh, especially you know, before you take the quiz, especially before you take an exam, make sure you've, you've done the homework there. 
Okay, uh, office hours. I've got um, office hours on Fridays at 10. And, uh, and I, I like when students come to office hours, um, you know, especially in this online setting where um, I rarely get to interact with uh, students, um, even just in a kind of a uh, informal setting, um, at least with office hours, um, you know, if you have questions, I'm happy to, uh, to answer your questions. Um, and uh, if you've, if, you know, if you have questions about the statistics major or data science major or things like that, uh, I'm also happy to, um, to answer your questions about that. Um, and, and it's also, you know, a place if you need, um, if you have questions about points you've lost and things like that, you know, you can come to office hours for that. But I do have to say, those are my least favorite questions that I get. It, it definitely, if we've made a mistake, um, you know, you, you deserve the points that you've earned. Um, again, my, my recommendation is you first go to the T8 um, for regrade requests and things like that. But if, uh, if that doesn't get resolved, you can come to me as well. Um, all right. Okay. Um, are there any questions before we go on? Before we get into um, today's um, content? Uh, this is just, we've just kind of spent the time going over the syllabus and course policies and how things are going to work. Okay, well, if there's no questions, why don't we take a, um, a quick five minute break here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. All right. Um, okay, so here we go. Um, Oh, let me give you your second quiz answer for the day. Your second quiz answer for today is D as in dog. D as in dog is your second quiz answer. Okay, so I hope you guys all got that. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, here we are. Uh, welcome to Stats 10 Introductory Statistics. And I just want to say, uh, <laughs> allow me to be a little bit uh, cheesy and gushy, but, uh, but I love statistics um, and I love teaching this class. Uh, when I took uh, my introductory statistics, so when I was an undergraduate student, so this was a long time ago, uh, I took an introductory statistics class and it literally changed my life. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if this class will have, a, have the same effect on you, but uh, you know, I can dream and hope. But, um, but yes, yeah, so when I took uh, introductory statistics as a student in undergrad, uh, it literally changed my life. I was an engineering major um, in undergrad and, uh, and I finished my degree in engineering, but, uh, but I took um, stats and I fell in love with the subject and I took uh, as many stats classes um, that were offered by, uh, you know, I went to a tiny little um, college and, um, and I took all the stats classes that were offered um, there and then I, after I graduated, I I worked for a little bit, um, but I said, you know what, I want to go back to um, I want to go back to grad school, and I chose to study statistics in uh, in graduate school, and so I came to UCLA. Uh, I got my master's and PhD in statistics uh, at UCLA, and um, and then while I was uh, you know, getting my PhD, I had to, um, uh, part of the, uh, part of my studies was to also teach, um, at work as a TA. And when I worked as a TA, so, um, that's when I realized I enjoy teaching, um, that I really liked teaching. And, you know, I originally came to grad school thinking I would go back and work in industry, but then after, um, working as a TA, I realized I, I really, really enjoy teaching. And so I, um, I decided to pursue teaching full time. And then, um, and just by, you know, luck and, um, you know, being at the right place at the right time, um, after I graduated UCLA with my PhD in statistics, um, a position, a teaching position opened up uh, at UCLA uh, in the statistics department. And, uh, and I slipped right in. So, you know, I think I got really lucky because 
the, the department was familiar with me as a TA and uh, and so I started teaching. Um, so that's when I started teaching back in, uh, I guess, 2015 now. So uh, this is five years ago. And, uh, and that's been a dream come true. I feel like I've got um, my dream job. This, it's been such a, a huge blessing. And, uh, and, I, and I truly, truly, truly love teaching statistics. Um, I love teaching this intro stats class. Um, I also teach some upper division classes that are uh, focused a little bit more on the computer programming side of statistics, uh, but but I love it all. I hope um, I hope you guys enjoy the class. Okay, I you know um, I, I know not all of you <laughs> are going to become stats majors, um, so uh, so that's okay. But I hope at least uh, by the end of the course, you will at least gain uh, an appreciation for the subject and, uh, and that you will gain some statistical uh, literacy and in that, you know, if you read papers or things like that and they talk about statistics, that you won't just skip over it, um, that, that you'll, you'll read it and you'll understand it. Um, you know, so sometimes, uh, uh, this, this has not much to do with anything, but, but sometimes when you, um, when you meet people and, you know, part of, uh, part of that conversation of like, uh, meeting people is they, like, people ask, oh, what do you do? You know, like, what, what is your job? Um, and, uh, and I'll tell them I teach statistics and sometimes, uh, the response I get is, oh, I hated statistics or, um, oh, I, I should hated that class or something and when people say that that always kind of hurts my feelings a little bit because this is a, a subject that i i love dearly and and uh <laughs> you know it, it's not nice when somebody says that they hate the thing that you love so um so anyway my hope is that after this class if somebody ever um tells you that they that they do something with statistics that you won't <laughs> that you won't give them that reaction, that you'll say, oh, you know what? I took stats in college and I actually enjoyed the class. I don't know. I have, I have my dreams and my, uh, uh, anyway. <laughs> so anyway, I love statistics. I put little three hearts here because uh, I hope you guys enjoy the, uh, enjoy the class. All right, so um, let's talk about what this class is all about, all right? So, um, this is what I consider to be the most important ideas of the course statistics. And, um, and so I would say these are, um, this might be the most important slide in the entire course because, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we will spend a good amount of time. We're gonna spend the next six weeks um, working through the uh, the textbook. Um, we're gonna get through uh, nine chapters, okay? So in this textbook, there's 10 chapters and we'll get through, uh, we'll get through nine of them in six weeks. Um, we've got a, a fairly ambitious schedule here. Um, and, you know, you'll learn how to do certain tasks, but in 10 years, will you remember everything? Will you remember the exact procedure? Um, maybe not, okay? And, and, I, and I'm okay with that, all right? I'm okay if you forget some of the um, exact procedures and exact steps that, that you need to take care of, that you need to do in order to uh, accomplish some kind of task. But um, I do hope that you'll remember at least all of these, that these five points, you will remember all of them, okay? That, um, and I'll, I'll go, go through each of these, but, uh, but 10 years from now, 20 years from now, long after the class is over, I, ho I hope these, will, these five bullet points will have been uh, kind of internalized. And at least that's, that's what I want you to take away. Um, these are the kind of key ideas of this subject of statistics, okay? Uh, and so number one is that we can make conclusions from observed data. That's, the, uh, that's probably the most important um, idea from the course is that we're going to be making conclusions from data and that basically uh, conclusions from data are going to be more reliable than conclusions that we make based on gut feelings, based on anecdotes, uh, things of, uh, of other natures that uh, when we make conclusions based on 
data and evidence that has been observed, you know, our, our decisions are, are going to be better. Okay. Um, the, uh, the next point is that we can make conclu uh, the conclusions that we make, we make conclusions about large populations that we cannot directly observe. So even though um, when, you, when you go out and collect data, you're only going to be able to collect a, uh, a handful of data. There's only a certain amount of data that you are able to collect because of the limited resources that you have. Um, you know, every um, data point, every observation you record requires time and energy, and, and we don't have infinite amounts of that. So you're only going to get um, a certain amount, but even based on that, you can make conclusions that generalize to large populations. And I'll, I'll talk exact, about exactly what a population is, um, but that's, that's the second point, okay? Uh, the third point, uh, and this is a key idea here also, is that you might observe an association between variables, okay? So when you look at your data, you, there might be uh, an association that we observe, and that could mean, that could mean there's an association between the variables and the population. So you might observe 100 people, and in, among those 100 people, there seems to be a relationship between, you know, um, you know so, cer some certain trait and, you know, some certain action that they do or something. There might be some kind of uh, relationship between, uh, you know, w whatever it might be, okay? That could be something that you observe in your data, and that could mean that there's an association in the population, or it's also possible that the association that you've observed is a random fluke, okay? So you might notice in your data, it might be that left-handed people are more likely to, I don't know, study math or something, okay? Now that could just, that could be a real thing, okay, that exists in the population that maybe in, it is true that all left, more left-handed people study math than other subjects, I don't know, okay? Or it's also a possibility that it's just a random fluke, that just, it just so happened that in your data, the left-handed people happen to study math or something, okay? Who knows, all right? Uh, and so that's an important idea, and we'll, uh, we'll delve into that um, a little bit deeper as we uh, go on in the course, okay? And so um, in order to decide whether the association actually exists in the population, or if it's a random fluke, uh, we're going to have to learn probability, okay? Learning probability teaches us about randomness, and that's going to help us decide if our data was a random fluke or not, okay? So that's, um, in the course, we're going to learn some probability, and that's, the point of this is so that we can distinguish between uh, real observed phenomena versus random flukes in our data, all right? And the, uh, the last bullet point will be the statistical tools that we're going to learn. This is all going to be kind of stuff after the midterm. Like the confidence interval, the z-test, and the t-test, these produce numeric values that assist us in making conclusions, okay? And so we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the statistical tools. And, and you're going to learn how to do a confidence interval, a z-test, and a t-test. And you'll definitely need to know how to do these for the final exam. If, you know, in 10 years, you forget how to do a z-test or a t-test and you don't remember, I will feel okay about that, all right? If, uh, you know, as long as you remember that, oh yeah, these things, these tools do exist and they can be used to help us make conclusions, uh, I'll be okay if you forget the exact procedures and the exact steps that, that are involved, okay? Um, but if you forget this, that we can make conclusions from observed data, you're going to break my heart, okay? So, um, so I hope this is the, the, the bullet points that, uh, that you take away, uh, that you remember uh, from this course here, okay? So, um, so this is what the course is going to be all about. Um, we're going to cover um, chapters one through nine in the, uh, in the textbook, okay? Um, we're going to cover nine chapters in six weeks, and uh, so it's going to be a fast-paced course, okay? Um, we're, we're gonna cover chapters one through six in the first three weeks, and then we're gonna cover chapters seven, eight, nine in the last three weeks. Okay, and it feels a little bit unbalanced, but, um, but, it, but my experience is that this is the, the appropriate pacing. Chapters seven, eight, and nine are a lot 
heavier in content and, uh, and do take a little bit longer to kind of grasp and digest. And so uh, I think it's appropriate to spend more time on those. And chapters one through six are a little bit um, quicker uh, and easier to pick up. And so I think uh, moving through those briskly is, uh, is okay. Um, but that said, we're covering a lot in the uh, six, week of, six weeks of time that we have. And so the course definitely will feel fast paced. You're gonna be doing a little bit um, uh, each day through the week, okay? We've got two lectures each week, uh, Mondays and Wednesdays, and every lecture builds on the previous lecture. So, uh, so don't skip class. If you're not able to attend live, that's okay. Just make sure you watch that video, okay? And these viewing quizzes um, are here and they're, they're worth um, points uh, and they're here with the intention of keeping you on track so you don't fall, it, fall behind, okay? Um, don't hesitate to, um, to ask me, oh, I should say ask, not task, uh, ask me or the TAs for help. Uh, we're here to help you learn, we're here to help. Um, and so if you're struggling with something, if you've got questions, uh, definitely come to our office hours. Um, you know, um, that's, uh, we're, we're here for you guys. So, um, you know, our goal is to help you learn. So, um, so that's what we want. All right, this is uh, kind of our plan uh, in this week. Uh, today we're covering chapter one, the nature of data. Uh, on Wednesday we'll cover chapters two and three, and then next week we'll cover chapters four and five, and week three will be chapter six and the midterm exam, and then starting in week four after the midterm exam we'll, we'll, uh, we'll slow it down a little bit, covering chapter seven, chapters eight, and chapter nine, okay? And um, this is how we're going to get through uh, our nine chapters of, of content, okay? Um, if you don't have the textbook already, uh, please make sure you get a, a copy of the textbook. Um, you can get uh, an electronic version uh, from the publisher. Uh, I think I sent out a link uh, that's, I think, Vital Source is, uh, is the pub, um, kind of their partnered site where you can just get a immediate access to the uh, electronic version um, out there. And, uh, and you don't need any of the additional stuff. Sometimes they try to upsell you with, I don't know, um, all of these gizmos and gadgets and add-ons. Uh, you don't need any of that, okay? You just need the text um, for the, uh, the homework problems and kind of the uh, explanations that are, that are in there, so. All right, this is kind of um, how we are going to, um, this is like a little roadmap of some of the concepts. And so this first week, uh, and actually, so chapters one through four are all on descriptive statistics. It's all about taking the data that we have and summarizing it and being able to describe the data on hand. And that's gonna be um, the first four chapters. And then chapters five and six, uh, chapter five is about probability and chapter six is about probability distributions, okay? And that talk about, you know, likely events and unlikely events and help us understand randomness. And, um, and we're going to take that and, uh, and build off on that to uh, get probability distributions in chapter six. And in chapter seven, we discuss sampling distributions which is going to be about kind of the probability of getting, you know, particular summary values. And, and I'll explain all of this when we get there. And those two ideas come together to form statistical inference, which will be kind of our last two chapters, chapters eight and nine, where we make conclusions about the population based on the summary values and their probabilities. So that's, um, that's how we're going to tie these things together. Because sometimes as we're going through the course, you know, we start off describing statistics, uh, describing our data, and then it seems like we jump over to probability and probability feels unrelated. And it's true, when you go from descriptive statistics to probability, there is a little bit of a, a disconnect, but they do come together and they tie together. And that, um, you know, a big idea in the class is that we need to understand randomness in order to distinguish between real phenomena in our data and random flukes uh, that happen. 
And in order to kind of distinguish that, we have to understand probability. And so we learn, take time to learn probability and we bring together our understanding of probability and randomness through sampling distributions and, um, and our descriptive statistics in order to make the conclusions. Right? And I'll, I'll emphasize all of this as we uh, go along in our class. All right, um, and so before we delve into um, all of that, I just wanna take a moment and pause, and this feels a little bit out of place, but, but I do wanna say, it is a fast paced course, okay? We've got six weeks, we're gonna be covering nine chapters, and I, I just wanna say, through all of this, your health is important, okay? Your physical, your mental, spiritual, and emotional health um, is, is important. It's far more important than your grades. And I know in the middle of school, while you're taking classes, uh, because all of your efforts and energy are devoted largely to classes and your grades, um, it, your grades feel very important, okay? And certainly, um, the, that, that's understandable. I, I get it. I was a student too, and, um, and if you're a UCLA student, you're a UCLA student because in high school you worked really hard and you got good grades, right? Um, or, in, or you went to community college and you transferred to UCLA, and at community college, you got good grades. Nobody gets to UCLA without having gotten good grades, okay? And many of you were valedictorians at your high schools and things like that. And, uh, and I understand kind of the, the pressure to, uh, to get good grades, okay? But, um, but your grades, it's not worth sacrificing your mental health or emotional or um, physical health uh, for the sake of grades. So, um, so always keep keep things in perspective, okay? Um, if you get sick or experience issues in your life, uh, let me know. Um, I'll try to be flexible and accommodating uh, to you within reason. Uh, I'm here to teach you. The, the uh, TAs are also here to teach you, and uh, we're also here to support you, okay? We don't, um, we don't want uh, any of our students to fail. Um, and so if, uh, if things are going wrong, um, you know, let us know and we'll try to, we'll try to be uh, accommodating, okay? Uh, but please uh, talk to us, okay? If you don't say anything, all right, um, and then just like the day before the final, you say, I wasn't able to do this, it, you put us in a difficult position, okay? Because uh, at that point, it's, it's difficult for us to kind of turn things around. Um, so uh, when things are going wrong, you know, I know it's, sometimes it's hard to, uh, to reach out uh, during the, these times, but, um, but please do, please uh, keep us informed uh, and then we can start working with you and start making a plan um, rather than not saying anything and waiting until the final exam or waiting till the last week of class. Um, and uh, so that, that's always hard, okay? And, so, and, and this is just, not just for this class, but just in life in general. When things start going wrong, um, let, let people know uh, right away, okay? Uh, even, even for your physical health, if you notice something is not quite right, you should go see a doctor right away, uh, rather than waiting for things to get um, so bad that you cannot ignore it, okay? It's when, when there's a small problem that you feel like you can ignore, that's actually the time you should address it because the uh, taking care of it and helping correct things at that time is a, is a lot easier than allowing things to progress to a point where it cannot be ignored and then trying to correct it at that point is, uh, is really hard. So, uh, so please do that. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's get into chapter one. Chapter one is all about the nature of data. Um, and we will talk about samples and populations and variables and how to collect data, observational studies, and experiments, okay? And, uh, and that will be it for today's lecture, okay? So um, the big idea, I, one of the big ideas I presented was that we can make conclusions from observed data, all right? And that's what the subject of statistics is all about, is about making conclusions from observed data. And I would say right now, <laughs> in this, uh, we are living in the golden age of data, okay? Maybe it's a dark age of privacy 
and and we as a society need to figure out uh, how much we value our privacy because it sure seems like we don't and we are giving away all of our private information to companies that that just ask for it they say hey I'll, we'll give you a free app if you uh, give us your privacy information. And uh, and people seem to be going along with it. Uh, maybe we don't fully understand what's going on, but it, uh, but companies are collecting um, so much data. We are generating so much data. If you own a cell phone, if you've got a cell phone, you are generating so much data. Um, it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, your cell phone is constantly pinging its servers and saying, hey, um, I'm here, I'm located at this, <laughs> this location, um, and, uh, and, and this has been a thing for a long time, um, and that, you know, e even since uh, the 90s, so over 20 years, um, police could check out, you know, cell phone tower records and see which cell phones connected to which cell towers to uh to say um you know there was a connection at uh, at this point in time so anyway um we're generating tons of data every everything you do online um your clicks are being recorded uh just you know i as a teacher on ccle i can see every single link that a, a student clicks you know when you say um when you click on a link and um and you open up a file, uh, the uh, the servers keep a record and say, oh yeah, so and so student opened up the lab, you know. And so, so sometimes when a student says, hey, you know, like uh, I've been working, this is a very rare occurrence, but it, but it has happened where a student say, says, you know, I worked really hard in this class, and uh, and I struggled with the material. I can easily check the logs. And it might show that, you know, hey, you know what, this student actually rarely logged into the class website, rarely clicked any of the links, rarely clicked any of the work. And so, you know, their claim of working really hard in the class might not actually be true. This, um, I would say that it's a rare occurrence, but it has happened. Um, um, so, but anyway, just being able to see the log myself, I realize how much of our activity is being tracked and traced um, and it seems like every website you go to, as soon as you go on their thing, a, a thing that says like, do you accept cookies? And you either have to say I accept or I don't. And just to even read the articles on the web page or whatever it is, you have to click accept and they're tracking all of this data. So anyway, um, all to say companies in every sector are gathering, spending lots of money to get data. They have data. And every field of science is trying to uh, research or uh, gather information from that data. Okay, and the reason why we are investing so much in data, why all of these companies want the data, is because it has been shown time and time again that conclusions and decisions that are based on data, okay, are more reliable than the decisions based on gut feelings, tradition, and intuition. Okay. So, you know, some people live their life just guided by their emotions and their gut feelings. And, uh, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, okay? But if you are running a company, okay, it has been shown time and time again that decisions based on data are going to have more predictable outcomes and more reliable outcomes. Um, than, than decisions based on kind of gut feelings and, uh, and intuition, okay? And, uh, and a lot of times the data aligns with kind of tradition and intuition, like these decisions that have been kind of being made for a long time in the industry, uh, a lot of times the data aligns with that, but sometimes the data goes against that. Um, and uh, and it's, a, it's interesting that, the, um, that we're able to make these uh, these kinds of decisions. So, um, so that's what uh, I hope you guys uh, um, learn in this class is that the, the decisions we make based on data will be uh, more reliable. Right? And then, uh, and the other big point, uh, another big point that we'll cover today is that we make conclusions about populations. Okay, 
the conclusions we make are about large populations that we cannot directly uh, observe, right? So when we perform um, any kind of research, there's some kind of question that we want to answer, okay? So I'm kind of in the scientific method, scientific process, we, we ask questions and we want, to, uh, we want to be able to answer them, right? So is, so here's an example, right? Is an experimental drug ABC effective at treat, treating disease XYZ, right? So um, this is just kind of a ge general question, but you know, right now uh, amidst the uh, coronavirus COVID-19 uh, pandemic, um, you know, there's questions, is it, is uh, hydroxychloroquine effective at, uh, uh, as a treatment for COVID-19? Or are these other things? Is uh, vaccine being proposed? Is that, is that effective, okay? And, uh, and how do we answer that, right? We, we don't wanna just go off of gut feeling and intuition, right? Um, we, want, um, we wanna go off of basically uh, scientific evidence and findings, and, um, and we need to be able to, um, to answer that. So, um, so we'll talk about some ideas that, that come into play when we try to make conclusions about the, the population, right? Um, other examples like in, uh, in marketing, um, if we increase the cost of a product by 5%, how many, uh, will, how many people will still buy it? Um, sorry, good. I don't know what happened here, this is a typo. How many people will still buy it, right? So, um, you know, I don't know how much, uh, I forget how much Netflix, the Netflix subscription is, right? But there's uh, a lot of services that people uh, subscribe to, Netflix and Spotify and, you know, different things. And those companies, they want, they want to make as much money as possible, okay? And there is a balance between, can we charge more for our subscription service, right? What if we bumped up the cost of the subscription by a dollar? What if we bumped up the cost of the subscription by, um, you know, so-and-so, you know? Uh, a few years ago, um, I don't know if you guys have Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime bumped up the cost of their Amazon Prime subscription. They went from $100 a year to $120 a year, okay? That decision was not based on just like, um, uh, that decision was based on data because they wanted to know, can we increase the cost of our service by 20% going from $100 to $120? And how many subscribers will we lose when we make this price increase, right? So. So they had to kind of try to figure this out based on the data, uh, looked at the data and things like that. And they made that decision. And you know what? A lot of people kept it. A lot of people said, all right, we'll go with it, right? Um, and so these are the decisions that companies want to make, right? Um, what proportion of, proportion of voters have a favorable opinion of some pol politician? John Q. Public, right? So you can think of any politician. And in general, politicians want to win elections, okay? Whether they are the incumbent, whether they are a challenger, they want to win the election. They want, uh, they want to know how many people will vote for the, uh, them. And, uh, and so there's polls and things like that. Um, they're trying to, um, we're looking at data to, to understand this, okay? So all of these questions that we're asking have a population, okay? And the population is defined as everyone, everyone who is relevant to answering the question. So if we're talking about disease XYZ, the population is everyone who has disease XYZ. So if we're, if we're looking to see uh, if a treatment is effective at treating coronavirus, it would be everybody who has, uh, who's been infected by coronavirus. Now that population, um, in all cases, the population is too big or impractical to study and observe directly. Right? So the problem with uh, coronavirus is that we don't know exactly who is infected, okay? Um, there are people who are asymptomatic, all right? And so even just trying to figure out whether somebody is in this population, whether somebody has a particular disease, um, is almost impossible for us to answer, okay? Um, if we increase the cost of a product, how many people will still buy it? Um, that's going to be all potential customers of the product. So it's going to be everybody who has the product right now or subscribes to the product. Um, but it could also be, you know, 
potential buyers of the product, right? And, and we have no idea exactly who's in that um, population, right? Um, if we're talking about favorable opinions of a population, uh, of a politician, the population is gonna be all voters who could vote for or against that politician. And again, the population is too big or it's um, impossible as, for us to find every single person in that population. And so what we do is instead of trying to study the, uh, the population, which is everybody, we have to select a sample, okay? And a sample is going to be a selection, a selection of people taken from the population, okay? So ideally, ideally, the sample that we select is representative, okay? Um, and, and that means um, that the people we select will represent, even though we're not selecting everybody, that the selection looks kind of like a mini version of the population, right? And, um, and the information that we record from our sample, that forms what we call our observed data, okay? The information we record um, in our sample form our observed data. And what we wanna do is we're hoping that this selection is like a miniature version of the big population. And so um, based on the data that we see in the sample, we wanna make conclusions about the population, right? So if in our sample, some treatment is effective at tre treating the disease, we're hoping that because it was effective for this group of people, it will also be effective for the larger population in general, right? If, uh, if we are looking at, if we're interviewing people and asking, do you like this and this politician, based on what we see in this sample, maybe we interviewed 500 people and um, people, you know, like a particular uh, politician, we're hoping that the conclusions we make on this group of 500 people can be generalized to the larger population. That's what we want to do, okay? So, um, so here's the example, right? So if we're interested to see if an experimental drug, ABC, is more effective at treating um, disease XYZ than the conventional treatment, right? The population would be everyone with the disease, right? And we have no way to track everyone down, okay? We can't study this population directly, right? And so instead of studying everyone, we get a sample. We get a sample of volunteers, right? And we're hoping that the sample of volunteers is representative or looks like a miniature version of the population, okay? And so, you know, when you see drug studies, they'll often list off kind of demographic information of the, um, of the volunteers and things like that. So you can kind of make a decision on whether or not this, uh, this set of volunteers is representative of the population, right? Um, and then we gather data from that sample, right? So in the, uh, in the sample, we give some people the drug, other people we give the traditional treatment, okay? And um, perhaps the people who took the experimental drug recovered from disease XYZ at a higher rate than those who did not, okay? So in the sample of data that you've observed, maybe it seems, it appears that your, uh, your drug is um, pe people who took the drug recovered at a higher rate, okay? So if that's the case, then our data could support the idea that the experimental drug is effective at treating disease XYZ, all right? So, so it could be um, the reason why we see um, that the drug was more effective in our sample is because the drug is more effective, okay? It's also possible we also have to explore the possibility that the drug appears to be more effective in our sample um, just because it's a random fluke, right? So it's possible just coincidentally, right? Uh, we can say, you know, maybe some people were gonna recover from the disease anyway, and just coincidentally that more people who recovered from the disease just happened to uh, take the experimental drug, that the experimental drug actually is not the thing that's responsible for um, the better recovery, but just that, um, 
that it was a kind of a random fluke that people who were going to get better anyway, just more of them happened to be assigned to take the, uh, the drug. So that's also a possibility. Okay. So we have to, uh, we have to consider that and, uh, and we're going to study how, how this is done. Um, but this is just kind of an example of the idea of looking at a sample and making a conclusion about the population. All right. How do we feel about all of this? Is this feeling okay? And if it's feeling okay, you can give me a little green check mark in the participants window. Um, as I'll take a sip of my coffee. All right. Oh. And uh, okay, well, thank you everybody for, uh, for your feedback there. Uh, that's, that's good to hear. Any, um, and again, if you have any questions, just throw them in the chat um, or you can raise your hand um, in the participants window and things like that. So um, I'll try to, uh, try to react to, uh, to your questions there. All right, so um, we're gonna be making conclusions about the population based on a sample, okay? So how do we select who ends up in a sample, right? And that process of selecting people from the population to be part of our sample, that process is known as sampling, okay? And what we want is we want the sample of people or individuals that we select to look like the big population, right? That's what we want. We want the samples that are selected to be representative of the population, right? A sample that is not represented is said to be biased, okay? So for example, if your sample selects too few or too many people from a, a particular racial group, your sample will be biased, okay? And so, um, you know, uh, this, this was a, an issue for, for many years and a lot of uh, medical studies is that um, a lot of medical studies in the past were um, done primarily on, uh, on white people, okay? And, um, and there were very few uh, people of color or minority races um, represented in these medical studies. And so things that, uh, um, you know, for, for different reasons, um, the results of this medical study might not generalize to the entire population, okay? And so, uh, you know, those, those kinds of uh, studies, we would say just uh, the results might be biased in that um, it maybe it generalizes to the population that it's representative of, but may or may not be um, generalized to, uh, to the general public or the entire population, okay? And, uh, and this, is a, this is an issue um, that, that pops up in, in all sorts of different things is that when you select a sample, you might select too many or too few of a, of a particular group of people. Maybe you selected too many or too few uh, women or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, ideally, ideally your sample that you've selected is representative of the population, but it's, but it's actually a very difficult thing to pull off, okay? So one method that should produce a representative sample is simple random sampling, okay? But it's also important to note that simple random sampling is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed to produce a representative sample, okay? So, um, so let me explain what simple, simple random sampling is, okay? Simple random sampling starts with a sampling frame, okay? A sampling frame should be a list of everyone in the population, okay? This is actually <laughs> very difficult to achieve in real life, okay? And the sampling frame is often the, the source of a lot of bias, right? So and UCLA is located in the uh, city of Los Angeles, in the, uh, in, in the county of Los Angeles. And let's say we just had the task and we said, we wanna get a sample that is representative of the city of Los Angeles, okay? So in that case, the population would be the entire city of Los Angeles which I think is something around uh, 4 million people. And if you go to the entire county, it's around 10 million people, okay? Um, so we want the, uh, just the, the population um, 
and we would need to get a list of everyone. And getting that list, the sampling frame, is actually very, very uh, hard to do, okay? Um, there are people, um, like, where, where would you even start, right? <laughs> um, maybe you could go to the DMV and ask who's got a driver's license, but then you're gonna miss everybody who's, um, who doesn't have a driver's license or who, do, or who don't have records with the DMV, right? There's, uh, uh, you can try to go to the post office and see who's got addresses, but there's a lot of people who don't have permanent addresses, okay? There's a lot of people who've moved recently to the city and uh, did not update their records, okay? And so getting a sampling frame is, uh, is quite difficult, okay? But anyway, once you have a sampling frame, then the idea is you're gonna select individuals one at a time uh, at random from the sampling frame, okay? And that's it, right? It's simple random sampling. You just, you have a list of everyone, that's the sampling frame, and you're just gonna pick people at random. Now random, when you do random, it has to be a truly random thing. You can't, uh, you cannot ask a person to do random. You cannot say like pick people from the list at random because uh, what people will pick uh, is arbitrary but it's not random. Random, there's certain properties, and, and we'll talk about that uh, when we get to chapter five, um, but there should be a random process that goes into it, and that means uh, every individual has an equal chance of being selected, and every possible sample has an equal chance of being selected. So uh, you can think of lotto numbers. There's usually a machine with little ping pong balls with numbers written on it that bounce around. Um, lotto numbers are simple random sampling, so the, the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six is just as equally likely to be selected as the exact combination 9, 12, 23, 31, 47, 52, okay? So that's a uh, simple random sampling. Um, once you have a sample selected, then we are going to uh, record information about the individuals that we've selected, all right? And, uh, and each piece of information that we record is called a variable, okay? And they're variables because they vary, they can vary from person to person, right? And we've got two types of variables. We've got numeric variables and we have categorical variables, right? So numeric variables describe a quantity, like how much or how many. They often come with some kind of units. So it'll be like, how tall is someone? This person is 67 inches tall, okay? Uh, how much does a person weigh? This person weighs 135 pounds, okay? Um, or it could be, uh, how many um, siblings does someone have? This person has one sibling, okay? Um, and then on the other hand, we have categorical variables, okay? Categorical variables tell us what type or what kind, okay? Um, it could be something like, um, what color hair does this person have? Okay, this person has black hair or brown hair. Um, you know, uh, th things of that nature, okay? Um, so that we've got numeric and categorical variables. And when we uh, gather the data, we're often going to gather the data into tables, okay? We organize them into tables. And so um, what, um, the, uh, sorry, um, so when you put it into a table, um, I, um, you're gonna get uh, a sample size. How many people in your sample is uh, gonna be given the, the letter N, okay? So if you have 75 people in your sample, N is 75. And when you create your table, each observation is going to have its own row. Okay, each row contains only one observation. And, um, and so your table, if you have 75 people, if N is 75, then you have 75 observations and you will have 75 rows in the table. Okay, and each variable is gonna be a column in the table. Okay, each column contains only one variable. So here I've got a table uh, and we've got a couple people listed. We've got Alice who's 20, female, height of 62 inches, hair colors brown, area code 310. Um, we've got Brett, who's 19, male, 71 inches, hair colors black, area code 562, okay? 
So which variables are numeric and which ones are categorical, okay? So um, age is numeric, height is numeric, okay? What about area code? Is area code numeric or categorical? Okay, all right, great. So we've got a few people responding in the chat saying it's categorical and indeed it is categorical, okay? Um, it, it looks like a number, it looks like a number, but it doesn't tell us how much or what kind, okay? So when it comes to numeric things like age, it makes sense to say Alice is one year older than Brett. Alice is nine inches shorter than Brett, okay? But you cannot make some kind of comparison between area code. You cannot say Alice is 252 area code less than Brett. That, that kind of comparison does not make sense, okay? Because this number, this area code number, does not represent a quantity. It's just, it represents a geographic location, but represented by a number, okay? And um, I don't know, okay. So this, this does not represent a quantity. It's a category, okay? Um, gender, uh, you know, in this table we have female and male represented. Uh, you know, there, there are other genders that could be represented, non-binary, um, and things like that, um, and and that would that would show up here in categorical hair color, uh, you know whatever hair colors uh, you want to list off um, will, will also be categorical. And, and again, um, when you talk about uh, categorical variables, it's it's a type or kind and not um, not a quantity, right? So if if it makes sense to do a comparison and say something like so and so is older. And so and so, or there's a there's a difference, then then that's going to be numeric. Okay, okay so there we've listed this off. Uh, this is basically what I said. Okay, um, most of the time we record categorical data with a description of the category. So, for example, we can record hair color with brown, black, blonde, red, other things like that. Right. Sometimes we might code the categorical variables with numbers. Okay. And when you do this, uh, for example, we can say brown will get recorded with one, black um, gets recorded with the number two, blonde is category three, and things like that, okay? Uh, when you do this, it's important to remember that these numbers represent categories and don't have numeric meaning, okay? So it does not make sense to compare a person of hair category three and say that they have more uh, and then a person with hair category one. They're no longer, they, in the table, they might be, look like numbers, but they no longer represent numbers, okay? It doesn't make sense to um, say three is bigger than one if they're representing categories. So sometimes you will see um, categorical data, what we call uh, coded. Um, categorical data is being coded with numbers but they don't actually represent numbers, okay? Uh, on the other hand, it's also possible to take a numeric variable and turn it into something categorical, right? So you can take uh, age, which is traditionally thought of as a numeric variable, right? When you say, how old are you? Or what is your age? People generally respond with a number representing, you know, age in years, okay? So you'll say, I'm 21 years old, I'm 47 years old, I'm whatever it is, okay? Um, but it can also be turned into a category, right? So we can say, all right, somebody with age between zero and 17 is considered a minor. That's a category. Okay, anyone 18 and older is considered an adult, okay? Um, so you can have um, different categories based on, you can turn a numeric variable into a categorical one by kind of creating these, these bins. Okay, all right. I want to uh, talk about different sources of data. I've got a, like one minute left. I might go over just a couple minutes. Uh, just to, we have a couple slides left. And, um, um, and so I want to talk about our different sources of data. So we've got uh, anecdotal evidence, anecdotes, observational studies, and controlled experiments. Okay. So anecdotal evidence um, is basic, are basically people's stories, right? 
So that includes stories, you know, I know some, so-and-so, you know, my aunt was having this and then she bought essential oils and then her problem went away. Okay, great, okay. And, uh, and that's probably a perfectly valid story, all right? But the question, does that mean this solution that worked for her, is that gonna work for the general public, okay? And, uh, and the answer is, we don't know, okay? <laughs> we don't know, right? So, so any kind of um, stories that we have, customer reviews, testimonials, those are all um, types of anecdotal evidence, right? So anecdotes can be useful. Amazon reviews, Yelp, eyewitness testimony. Um, they can be useful, but we don't have any kind of statistical methods uh, that deal with anecdotal uh, evidence, okay? So, um, you know, before I buy something, I go on Amazon and I read reviews, okay? But we can't just read the reviews and say, okay, well, this is definitely what's going to happen to me or not going to happen to me, right? So sometimes, so on Amazon, it's, it's actually helpful to read both the positive reviews and the negative reviews to see, you know, what could happen and, and you have to kind of make a decision about, you know, whether this is a risk that you're willing to, uh, to take or not, okay? Um, and the issue with anecdotal evidence is that individual experiences vary greatly, right? And uh, and just because something happened this way for this one particular person, that does not necessarily mean it's gonna happen the same way for the general population. So, um, so that's what we've got for anecdotal evidence, right? And, and we're not, I'm not saying anybody is making up stories, right? So, uh, you know, if you have an aunt who had a problem and the essential oils helped out her situation, that could be a perfect, like, or we should say, rather than saying there's a cause and effect, right? It could be, well, there was an issue, there was this intervention, and later on this outcome happened. Now, it could be that those things are all related. It could also just be a coincidence that this is the sequence of events that happened, and we don't know, right? We don't know, okay? And it, we're not going to say that this is not the sequence of events happened, but it might not necessarily be that this intervention is the reason why this outcome happened. Okay. And so we have two kinds of uh, other things that, uh, that we do have statistical methods for, and I apologize for going a, uh, a couple minutes over here, is that uh, we have observational studies and we have controlled experiments, okay? So in an observational study, uh, we observe our subjects, okay? Ideally, our subjects that we've selected are representative of the population, and in general, we don't interfere with the subjects other than taking measurements, okay? Um, the subjects themselves choose whether to be in the treatment or control group. Uh, and when we do that, we can only find an association between two variables. We can't conclude that one, that changes in one variable cause changes in another variable, right? So a silly example is reading performance at school is related to the number of electronic devices at home. So if you say like, how many iPads, how many TVs, how many Kindles and I don't know, whatever it is, Alexa devices you have, um, you're gonna find, and this is true, that in general, households that have more of these electronic devices, generally their students will have higher perform academic performance at school, okay? And now why is that? Is it because these electronic devices are making the students smarter? And the answer is no, okay? It's not that, that the electronic devices are improving the uh, performance at school, but generally it's, a, it's an indicator of other, uh, other things like socioeconomic status, okay? And socioeconomic status in of itself is not, going, is not the reason why um, students have better performance at school, but is also an indicator of basically um, access and uh, opportunity for um, you know, you know, resources and things that that do encourage um, better perf school performance, right? So there's so things are complicated. What how what in changes school performance, uh, and it's a, it's a complicated system, and it's not the electronic devices, but there's there's other factors at play, right? So there's something a confounding variable is another variable that explains the association, and 
and it's a it's a little bit of a harder variable to define, but it'll be something like um, access and opportunity. Um, that's going to be re uh, responsible for kind of uh, reading performance and the uh, electronic devices. So from an observational study, we can only make an association and we cannot say uh, that one causes the other. And then on the other hand, with a controlled experiment, um, if it's set up properly, we can make a cause and effect conclusion. We can say that this intervention is responsible for the change in the outcome. Because in a controlled experiment, what we do is that the researcher assigns and says, you, this person will be randomly assigned to this treatment or intervention, and this person will be assigned to this treatment or intervention or a control group, okay? And ideally, everything else is kept the same, okay? For everybody in the treatment group and everybody in the control group, everything else um, is kept the same, you know? Um, um, and so, other than the treatments, everything else about these participants is the same. And so when we observe a difference in the outcomes, when we observe a difference in the outcomes, we can say because everything else was kept the same, the, and the only difference between this group and this group was that this got the treatment and this was control, that the difference in outcome can be attributed to the difference in treatment, you know, placebo versus the actual drug. Everything else was kept the same. And so because everything else was kept the same, there's no reason why this group or this group should be different other than the fact that this got the placebo and this got the, uh, the actual drug or things like that. Okay. And so, um, so those are uh, controlled experiments. And so we can make conclusions based off observational studies and controlled experiments. We don't have any methods that uh, can deal with anecdotal evidence. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what we have here. Okay, I apologize for going over. Um, I'll try to, I generally try to keep my um, lectures in on time. So we will end here for today. Um, and, uh, and please go to uh, your discussion sections. Oh, the third quiz answer, thank you. Thank you for reminding me, I'm so sorry. Third quiz answer today is C as in cat. C as in cat. So the last answer for the viewing quiz is C as in cat. Thank you for that reminder. And, uh, and you can be uh, answer the um, viewing quiz uh, now with uh, with those things and um, and we will end here and so um, have a good day uh, go to discussion and we will see you guys on Wednesday thanks guys thank you